Hello, dear basement dwellers. Today, we're traveling back in time to the turn of the century, a time when anime was but a niche within a niche, and watching most shows meant scouring the internet for fan subs with terrible karaoke that ruins the openings, but I'm probably the only person on the planet who actually cares about that part. Before Netflix with their slow releases, Amazon with their double paywall, Crunchyroll with their Yuri on Ice Awards, and pirate sites with their everything, one company reigns supreme as the great Satan of the anime fandom. Four Kids Entertainment. One more punch and say goodbye to your friend! Now pummel his head flatter than the shape of the earth! This dark dimension we're in is known as the Shadow Realm, a mystical place where incredible monsters can be summoned and the impossible is quite possible. Ah, impossible! These donuts are great! Jelly filled are my favorite! Nothing beats a jelly filled donut! Four Kids, now known as Four Licensing Corporation due to a whole mess of legal trouble, has been maligned by anime fans for over two decades now. Their often unfaithful translations and dumbing down of anime for a younger audience sparked the ire of purists who just wanted to see the anime that they wanted to watch as the original Japanese creators intended. But was Four Kids really that bad? I mean, from a business perspective, yes, absolutely. When Activision's Bobby Kotick is one of the better executives that your company has had, you've got problems. 4Kids was horribly mismanaged over the years and even ended up in legal trouble for going behind TV Tokyo's back with the Yu-Gi-Oh! license. But was their localization philosophy really as flawed as their detractors say? Or was there some merit to their approach? I mean, they did a lot of things wrong. How the story goes, we find out by the treasure in the grand line, there's no doubt. But they also did a lot of things gloriously right. The pirate whose eye is on it, he'll sing, I'll be king of the pirates, I'm gonna be king. But let's forget One Piece for a moment. If you're a 90s kid or older millennial, it's all but guaranteed that four kids had a hand in creating at least two pieces of popular culture that are lodged deep in your memory. If I were to ask you what part of the Pokemon anime you most vividly remember, Gotta Catch Em All would already be playing in your head before I finished the question. And were I to list four random first-gen Pokemon, say Electro, Diglett, Nidoran, Mankey, well, you're already filming in the rest of the rap while I'm talking, aren't you? The English Pokemon theme songs aren't just iconic, they're an integral part of what makes Pokemon Pokemon, at least for Western fans. And 4Kids created a lot of great songs for the show beyond that as part of their Pikachu's Jukebox segment. The Team Rocket rap Double Trouble is one of the greatest villain songs ever written. While it's inarguable that 4Kids took some things out of the original Pokemon anime that they probably didn't have to, they also put a hell of a lot more back in than just jelly donuts. And if they hadn't added in all of those fun new elements and made the series more accessible to Western children, it's kind of doubtful that it would have been the hit that it was stateside. I mean, the Team Rocket that we know and love to hate is as much a creation of four kids, writers, and voice actors as it is a part of the original anime, and they're some of the most iconic villains in the entire anime canon. Nintendo took the reins of the series back in the Ruby and Sapphire days, and ever since, well, it's kinda sucked. Their dub is a bit more faithful, but it's also infinitely more lifeless and boring. Pokemon is still a huge force in the Western market, but that's due entirely to the games. The show is no longer at the forefront of the phenomenon as it once was. Pokemon was key in introducing an entire generation of kids to anime, and it wasn't alone. Beyblade, Digimon, and Yu-Gi-Oh, not to mention Super Sentai, were all given the four kids treatment in one way or another back then, some from different studios like Nelvana and Saban, and if the enduring love for Power Rangers in the West is any indication, they didn't do a half-bad job of it a lot of the time. 
Removing the more heavily Japanese and adult elements did inherently change these shows and make it a bit hard for some kids like me to develop a firm grasp of geography. I thought that both my house and the Tokyo Tower were somewhere in the USA for years, but it also removed a huge barrier to entry for all of us. Unlike most anime, you didn't have to know anything about Japanese culture or history or folklore to enjoy these shows, which made it much easier to appreciate the strengths of their characters, animation, and storytelling. When I was younger, I didn't know that Pokemon was from a different country than, say, Goof Troop, but I did know that I preferred it and Metabots and Digimon and Card Captors and Dragon Ball Z to most other cartoons on television. As I grew older and developed a proper understanding of what anime was and where it came from, that preference evolved into an almost obsessive interest. I began seeking out works from Japan and learning more and more about the culture, and look where I am now. I don't think that any of that would have happened were it not for the initial interest sparked by those terrible 4Kids dubs. There are tens of thousands of people who love anime today who simply wouldn't if 4Kids and companies like them hadn't done everything they could to turn those shows into mainstream hits. Ghibli films and critical darlings like Your Name may be getting more love these days, but of the top five highest grossing anime films in US history, four of them come from franchises owned by four kids. We may not like how they treated the source material, but they went to bat for it in ways that almost no other licensor would dare, not even today. I mean, going back to that Pokemon soundtrack. The compilation album, To Be A Master, went gold in the US and platinum in Canada, selling 3 million copies worldwide. Everyone loves Gurren no Yumiya, but you don't see it pulling those kind of numbers. 4Kids played a big part in making Pokemon the phenomenon that it is today, but they didn't stop there. They gave Yu-Gi-Oh! the same treatment, pushing the figurative hell out of the movie and show even as they sanitized the literal hell out of the actual content. And it worked. When Yu-Gi-Oh! started airing and the cards came to North America, it was all that my friends and I talked about for months. And in my film school years, I'm not proud to say that I got back into the card game in a big way, playing from the You Need 3 Max C to Play wind-up format straight through the Dragon Rulers Holocaust. It's no coincidence that two of the three biggest card games in the world had their respective TV shows handled by four kids. They knew what they were doing when it came to pushing merchandise. They didn't just make it seem fun for a moment, they made it part of the lifestyle. It's time to duel. Gotta catch them all. As a kid, these were powerful calls to action. Of course, their push to make almost every show that they got their hands on into a hit like that could be detrimental as well. They really wanted their own version of Sailor Moon, and Tokyo Mew Mew, a story heavily focused on the tribulations of puberty, was not a good fit for their brand of censorship. But when they weren't desperately chasing their next mega hit, they cranked out a lot of shows that were just good, goofy be fun. I never found myself bored tuning into the Fox Box or 4Kids TV as it came to be known. Kirby right back at ya, fighting Foodons and Ultimate Muscle were never going to set the world on fire, but I remember watching each episode with a smile on my face as a kid. And of course I can sing all of the theme songs by heart. Ultimate Muscle! Ultimate Muscle! I'm embarrassing myself. And on that note, man, did 4Kids ever do a good job with Shaman King. Instead of trying to sanitize the show for younger kids, they kept it aimed squarely at the middle school crowd that it was meant for. They changed things because they're 4Kids, so of course they did, but they kept it dark and spooky, and they didn't try too hard to hide the Japanese elements either. Shaman King ended up being a solid transitional anime under their direction. It hit right when I was feeling a bit too old for the other offerings on the channel, and held my interest as I began discovering stuff like Naruto and Inuyasha. And that theme song, man, it still pops into my head at random sometimes. It might well be 4Kids' best musical work, and that is 
really saying something. Now, most of 4Kids shows weren't nearly that faithful or good, but they always brought on solid voice actors and wrote a lot of funny, at least for kids, jokes into their scripts. And while that might not be what I want as an adult anime fan, it was exactly what I needed as a kid just getting into it. 4Kids helped to create the current generation of weebs, just like the earliest anime fandom in the West grew because of even more inaccurate localizations like Battle of the Planets and Speed Racer. And while a cynic might say that they did that by accident while trying to sell toys and video games, they still entertained a generation until they were ready to look at anime more seriously, and that's commendable. But then, for people already taking anime seriously at the time, it must have sucked to see a show that you were looking forward to get snapped up and turned into a kid's show like that. The big problem wasn't necessarily that 4Kids was changing things, it's that they kept the original versions out of the West entirely as a result. Because 4Kids made Ultimate Muscle, the original Kinikuman series never really had a chance of coming westward. We never got to see the original thoroughly fucked up Yu-Gi-Oh! on Adult Swim, and it took years to see an accurate version of One Piece in the West, by which time Bleach and Naruto had totally eclipsed it. 4Kids' greatest sin wasn't that it tried to make these shows appeal to kids, it's that they denied older fans the option of watching the originals at all. And that was shitty, but it's not really a problem with 4Kids in particular, it's an issue with how licenses and copyright work in general. If they hadn't tried to compete with the likes of Funimation and ADV, if 4Kids had worked with them as Funimation and Crunchyroll are working together now and let them release uncensored, subtitled versions of their shows, I think that everyone would have been a lot happier. Still, 4Kids was a big part of many people's childhoods, and I don't think it's fair to paint them as this evil monster devouring and ruining our precious anime. Their primary goal was to make shows to entertain little kids, and speaking as one of those kids, they did a hell of a lot right. Maybe not as much or as right as Saban did with Digimon and Moncole Knights, or Nelvana did with Metabots and Cardcaptors, at least in Canada where they aired the full series, but I think we should cut them some slack, the same way that we should cut Amazon and Netflix a bit of slack. Even if they are mishandling anime, they are at least trying to bring it to a wider audience. 4Kids helped to create a few memorable anime villains, but ultimately they were never the big bad themselves. That said, let's keep these 4Kids version of blank memes going because they're hilarious. Anyway, that's my take on it, but what do you guys think? Do any of you have fond memories of the 4Kids dubs? Or were you old enough to complain about them on forums back when they were relevant and people still used forums? Let me know in the comments below, and while you're down there, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell to make sure you catch every Mother's Basement video as soon as it goes live. YouTube's recent algorithm changes are making it harder and harder for channels to reach all of their subscribers, and turning on notifications ensures that you won't miss a single upload. If you want to hear me talk more about anime from my childhood, check out my 300,000 subscriber special right over here, or go here to see me defend the strengths of the Death Note movie, another westernized anime take that everyone seems to hate. Or if this is the last that you see of me today, then I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.